In this session we are doing Sandhya Kriya. The last time we spent quite a lot of time talking about Sushumna Kriya and Sandhya Kriya or Sushumna application very naturally follows this. Sandhya is a very beautiful word and it means twilight, dawn or dusk. This is a time of twilight. It is time of transition. These transitions are very important in pranayama. The caterpillar principle of moving from one leaf to the other is a transition and it is very beautifully depicted through this image. And Sandhya is that time of the day or night which is also a transition period. So this transition period is in the Vedic um, tradition is a time for rituals. In the Vedic times they felt a certain power during the time of transition and they used this time of transition to focus the minds and they did this through rituals for those who could not have a direct experience through yogic methods they were prescribed uh, through rituals to focus on deities and uh, to contemplate on a process which in rituals is also can be very meditative and therefore the ceremonies that Brahmins perform is also known as Sandhya and these ceremonies or rituals are performed at dawn, at midday and at dusk. So these are the three Brahmin Sandhyas they are known as. But we are speaking here not of the Brahmin Sandhyas, the Vedic rituals, but of the yogic Sandhyas. This is a Tantric practice. Did somebody say something? Okay, I don't know what that was. <clears throat> Now in the Samaya tradition, Samaya means I am with you, it's the direct yogic experience. For us the transition period is the flow from the breath, the left to the right and the right to the left. And so the Sandhya is seen as a technique in which this flow is regulated and it is not merely from left to right and right to left, but it is that transition when it is in both. So for us it is a very simple technique to open both the nostrils and allow the breath to flow freely from both. It is this transition. We discussed this when we talked about this in our earlier sessions that there are cycles of around 90 minutes when the breath is in the right nostril and it shifts and it is for 90 minutes in the other nostril. But between this shifting it's not like it just shifts in a snap of a finger. There's a phase. Oopsie, it's pretty loud. Maybe you're hearing it. Now we see ambulance. So this transition period can be a little bit longer. Now here we are learning 
to go to this transition period where both the nostrils flow freely in a systematic manner at will using our willpower. Sandhya is also a simple meditation technique which allows the mind to be aware of the breath at the meeting of both the nostrils, allowing the thoughts to rise and fall away. So, it's not just a technique, but it's also meditation, which allows you to just be there and watch the thoughts flowing. So in the first one, you actually use a technique to open a, a blocked nostril so that both the nostrils are open. But in the second, you then allow your attention to focus between the two nostrils, the space there, and just allow yourself to become an observer. The third is a form of Sandhya, which is quite advanced, and that is this mystical thres threshold to the unconscious state of mind, between conscious and unconscious states of mind, where the practitioner gets access to the immense potentials of the mind and learns Sandhya Vasha, which would mean literally the twilight language a language spoken only by yogis. What does that mean? Is it a real language? Is it Sanskrit? No, it's not. It is a symbolic language. It's the way to speak. There is a traditional saying, only a thief recognizes a thief. That means that if you have attained access to the immense potentials of the unconscious mind, you know how another person who has also access to these unconscious potentials, how such a person looks, behaves, talks, speaks, you know, you can recognize such a person. And at the fourth level, Sandhya is the transition to the other shore. That is the transition between this life and death. Between death and rebirth. These are also transitions. And that mystery is revealed. So Sandhya is can be a a state, but it's also a technique. It's important to understand that that simple technique can gradually, with mastery and patience, over a long period of time, unbroken practice can lead us through the layers to far-reaching, deeper layers of the mind and spiritual experience. Okay, so far, any questions? Radhika ji, bottom Yeah. Uh, Radhika ji mentioned that uh, uh, Sandhya from a Vedic uh, perspective uh, is done at uh, uh, in the morning, the afternoon, and, and evening. Mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, so when we're talking from a yogic perspective, uh, while it, I, I can understand that uh, these are the three times it can be uh, it needs to perform, but does it mean that since this is something which is within uh, uh, the, the time is not something which is a I'm not sure what the question is. The time is not a constraint. I'm, I'm not getting you. Uh, the, is, uh, the time at which the Sandhya is performed yeah. uh, is secondary. 
Yes, of course. I mean, uh, ideally you want to have the direct experience of that state of transition. But due to cosmological reasons, the rhythms of nature and of the of you know of how the mind is influenced by these natural rhythms you see you know that when you have heard of people living in darker countries you know in the scandinavian countries they have sometimes six months of darkness you know how it is there people suffer from a lot of depressions because they don't get enough light and on the other hand they have also six months of a lot of light where there is no darkness and that during those periods they have a lot of difficulty sleeping this disturbs the entire pattern of life not just sleeping patterns waking patterns but but that's basically your entire personality your life so there's a, these natural patterns of day and night have a deep impact on our well-being so all these times of transitions also have some impact on us these times of transition naturally calm down the mind and give us access to the unconscious mind for those of you who have babies or have had babies you know the babies tend to cry a lot in the evenings in a certain transition time nobody knows why they cry i'm telling you now why they cry from a yogic perspective is that during this time the unconscious mind gets very active so either you get very restless and you get anxious worried excitable or if you are able to use those times to access that yogic energy or the creative energy and channelize that energy then the mind becomes naturally contemplative and you can go very easily easily is maybe not right but you can go deeper with less effort okay Yes. So that is why uh, these are. Uh, sorry, uh, just this follow-up question, which just pops up that uh, uh, while I understand there is there's a uh, uh, part, the, the cosmological patterns which actually impact on mind. So similarly, there are also inauspicious or uh, so times like you know eclipses, uh, which are not supposed to be good. So does this mean that one needs to refrain from doing uh, these practices when now? Uh, There are eclipses, or you know, probably there are other things which are not considered good from a Vedic perspective. Well, there are many, many such things. Now, if you start taking all these into consideration, you will not be able to lead the life you are leading currently. <laughs> Modern life is no longer compatible with the Vedic life because the Vedic life and rituals, everything was. created in such a way or organized in such a way that one lived in harmony with nature people were raised in such a way society culture all these things were promoted so that people lived in harmony with nature unfortunately we have gone so far from that now that to integrate the two seems to be a challenge that I don't see anybody being able to really pull off. We can. The only thing we can do is to try to integrate some of the more important things. So I don't think it's really important unless you are so sensitive or have reached at least this third stage here where you have access to the unconscious mind already that you would be sensitive enough to notice the difference in your meditation during a full moon and a no moon period to be different but how many of us would notice the difference if you don't know today is full moon or new moon 
you would not know the difference. You know, there are phases of waxing and waning in the moon. It's Shukla and Krishna. These are the two phases. The month is divided. So there are also finer feelings which arise or bhava or attitude which arises during meditation, during these phases of the moon, waxing or waning. Now, we would only be so sensitive if you are able to access already that unconscious level and if you're not able to do that, to you it will not matter. Because such a sadhak who has reached that fine state has a very sattvic mind and a very sharp buddhi. The others are still, relatively speaking, maybe tamasic or rajasic. So if you take everything into consideration, what ends up happening is you become one of those strict... Um, people who have so many rules that you cease to be flexible anymore. You become just a rigid, conservative religionist. That's what happens. And being a yogi is not being inflexible and rigid. It is the height of of flexibility where you respond uniquely to every situation. That's what buddhi is, that sharpness. So until you are able to have that access to the unconscious mind and that sensitivity and that sharpness of buddhi, until then I would say it's not necessary to follow all the complex Vedic rules. Our tradition is, in any case, a yogic tradition and a tantric tradition, which means we don't want to be bogged down by rules. We want to become free. You don't get free by adding more rules. You get free by learning to respond uniquely to every situation in your life. So these three transition periods of Sandhya are something that help us because light and day and you know the, the, the sunrise and sunset is, are very strong factors. The moon is not as strong, relatively speaking, unless as I said you are that sensitive. So these three periods are used also for yogic practice. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. Manoj asked, how can I know if I'm going into deeper layers of mind? Manoj, believe me, you will know it. When you go to the deeper layers of mind, you're going to know it. And then you will write me a message telling me <laughs> why and how or what is happening with you. So coming back to the technique, because this is very simple and that is sometimes the problem. It is so simple that the technique is often underestimated or dis even dismissed as too simple. People think that, you know, there can't be any value to this. It is also known as Sushumna awakening, Sushumna application, Sukhamana or just breath awareness. Why Sukhamana? Sukhamana means Sukha means happiness or happy or content. Mana is mind. Sukha, mana, together, when you see it together, it's Sushumna. Sushumna. It's the same thing. That is the origin of the, of the word Sushumna. Because when the Sushumna is awakened, the mind is happy and in that state it is naturally contemplative so it's very easy then to focus or stay with the breath at that time it is one of the most mystical practices most um, simple 
and yet most mystical practice which leads to sandhya, the threshold to the deeper states of consciousness. Since we talked about the timings, it is about the cycles. There are many cycles that influence us human beings. There is the lunar cycle, which is a monthly cycle, waxing and waning. There is the daily cycle of day and night. There are the annual cycles of seasons. And what most of us are not aware of, the cycle of the flow of the breath, which I have already mentioned, between left and right nostrils. And this is also one of the cycles of our body. Women, for example, have another cycle, the menstrual cycle, which is also a monthly cycle, which they also go through. Matia says, can it be felt a little bit tamasic, so joyous that, for example, can't follow the practice that time, how to surface? Hmm, I'm not following your question, Matthias. Um, you mean you don't feel comfortable at that time? A time of sandhyas, of transition? I'm not following your question, I'm sorry. Too much, very comfortable. <laughs> well, if you feel joy, that's good. You have to stay with it. You have to keep staying with it and, and stay longer with it. Now, well, if you feel so much joy that you can't concentrate, then maybe it's not joy as I am referring to it. But maybe a kind of excitement. Yeah, it's a, the, the online meeting is a bit, sometimes has its limitations because I don't know some of you personally. Those of you I know personally, I can guide. But if I don't know you personally, I cannot answer such questions. So for those of you who wish and have some questions that you want to share. You can also share with these things privately. You can write me a message, whether on email or um, on Facebook. But you also need to give me a little bit of background about yourself. Don't just write me questions out of the blue. I need to know you as a person. I mentioned that there are two kinds of teachers. Those who so wide and those who so deep. So I cannot um, say that I am sewing wide right now. In an online meeting, it is like that. It is a bit like that, sewing wide. But for those of whom I guide directly, personally, that's a different kind of guidance. That is then, you know, customized. <laughs> So, um, another thing I wanted to mention since uh, I, I talked about the online meetings right now, that um, next Friday and Sunday will be the last sessions before uh, our break. We're going to take a break from this and we will be coming back then in August. So next week... Friday and Sunday are the last sessions before the break. Okay? Coming back to the natural cycles. So, the breath cycle is one of the cycles that has a deep influence on us. And what is the breath connected to? The breath is connected to the nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which is connected to the left brain and the right brain. So, most people are not even aware that there is a change of flow between the left and right nostrils. You will be surprised that I was 
talking years ago to a good friend of mine who is a scientist, a research scientist, and he does work in um, neuroimmunology. He's a PhD from a, a very renowned university in the United States and has done a doctoral study on stress. And even though uh, with that kind of knowledge of the body and the nervous system, the immune system, he was not aware of this simple fact. He asked me how I knew this. And I said, well, it is common knowledge in yoga. But he said, okay, how did the yogis know this? Did they know this just empirically? Yes, because scientists are so used to doing the experiments on rats. He has many rats, which he kind of breeds specially for experiments, to perform experiments on this, that he was not aware that human beings, at least, have a breath cycle. It was shocking for me, and uh, it was a big surprise for him to find that out. But indeed, there is a 90-minute, 90 to sometimes even two hours, cycle between the two. And what this basically means that one nostril is dominant and the other is passive during that time. In every healthy person, this process of nostril dominance shifts approximately every 90 minutes. 90 to 120 minutes, I would say. And a very healthy person, because if you're unhealthy, it will stop. The shift will stop and it will be stuck on one side. This is how many of the Ayurvedic doctors, the Vaids, were able to sometimes even predict illness just by studying the breath of the person, of the patient. Now this is a physiological fact confirmed by yogis thousands of years through empirical study. They observed themselves. And you too can be a yogi and you can right now put your finger in front of your nostrils and test your exhalation. If you are not able to feel it easily, you can just lick your finger so that it's wet and you will then feel the breath of the nostril very easily and you will see from which side you're breathing dominant, which is dominant, which side the flow is stronger. So who's telling us which side is dominant? Everybody experimenting and checking which side is dominant? Right, Nita is right, Ashish is right, Yotam right, God. oh, Yotam is left, okay, uh, Manoj left, Hemashri right, Matthias left, Matthias you wrote me a private message by mistake I think, yeah, so you see it's um, different for different people. And if you know, the right nostril is connected to the left brain and the left nostril is connected to the right brain. Okay. So those of you who were, who said right, your dominant side right now is more analytical, logical and those who said left, they are in a more creative side right now and um, there is nothing like better or worse it's just different okay there's a very nice um, 
paragraph that Swami Rama explains in the Mundak Upanishad lectures. The left breath is called Ida and the right is Pingala. Ida is moon and Pingala is sun. So your human body is made of two currents, male and female. Ida is female and Pingala is male. Both of them are in you. You have both the aspects in you. Just as in a battery, you have two currents, negative and positive. And the two currents together go going together and the battery is charged. But it doesn't mean that negative is bad. But the, this explanation of electricity is very good because it fits very well to the, to the left and right and negative positive currents. We tend to immediately associate it or these words are sometimes loaded or colored. We immediately think of uh, negative current as bad or we may think of female or uh, you know feminine as uh, too soft you know everybody wants to be in a in a world which is a little bit um, left brain dominated here that is the right side the male the female aspects or the creative aspects uh, are always put down you know they are not given the same value and that is unfortunate that's where the imbalance starts when we begin to put greater value or emphasis on one side the balance is lost and when the balance is lost the body is diseased so these are the dualities of day and night, good and bad, man and woman, black and white, happiness, sadness, hot and cold. These are all the dualities that are around us which make up this world. And when the transition comes, that is the wedding of the sun and the moon, at that time one can go beyond these dualities because they both are balanced. That's why it is such a beautiful time for meditation. Any questions so far? Okay, then, as the yogis carried on their experiments, yes, they noticed that there was a change in flow and they also noticed that when it flowed through both, they attained a state of joy called Sukhamana. And here you see a chana or chickpea and this is a symbol of non-dual rea reality. Just like the Chinese symbol, the Tao, you know, the Tao symbol of yin and yang is black and white and, you know, the way it is put together. It's male and female united in a circle. And so this is also the two halves are male and female united in the shell here is a symbol of unity, of non-dual reality. So how do you practice Sushamana application? It's so simple that most people don't do it, <laughs> which is rather I unfortunate. Have a Sorry, yeah. I'm in between. No, no, no problem. Go ahead. That's slightly unrelated, but I was wondering if there is kind of when you do Atma Vichar. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference in the quality of response you get depending on which nostril is open? I guess so. I guess so. Definitely. So if you are looking for a more logical, analytical answer, then maybe there are some times when it is better 
and so to be kind of aware of which nostril is flowing during that time hmm would be good thing. in yeah. fact what the pranavadins used to do pranavadins were those who were able to access the unconscious mind through the use of pranic methods now what pranavadins do not that i'm recommending you to do this or anybody to do this is that they were uh when they ate food they activated their right nostril you know when they did certain things when they went to bed then they would activate left nostril you know all these kind of things so there were certain things they wanted to do they always did either when that breath was active or they would activate that particular nostril and only then do that particular action i think that that's not the right way because you can get a little bit crazy if you do that it also does not help long term to mess around too much with your breath cycle to do that so you can observe it and then if you find a difference good but you don't even need to observe your breath for that you can just observe your mind you will see it immediately in your own mind when you want to do something analytical you know when you are in a mood to do something analytical and when you are in a mood to do something creative then do something creative the whole problem is that in our life the current way our life is structured we are not able to make that we don't have that freedom of choice you are forced in a situation where you, if you have a 9 to 5 job you know you have to do certain kind of work even if your mind is not ready for that you are forcing your mind to do it so in those cases i would say even though you are aware of this do not mess around with the natural flow of the breath the 90 minute cycle or 120 minute cycle messing around too much with the cycle can be harmful if you do it through an entire yogic practice over a period of time then you build it up it's a different thing but just to to try to manipulate your breath all the time that's not a good idea so okay. so but doing it during the daily practice or the you know three or four times practice is that's all right yes Yes, because okay. you're you're gradually building it up. You know, you're you're taking the the mind and the breath gradually through the entire process and not abruptly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and you're not just manipulating your nervous system and your breath system. You know, there's a a deeper purpose behind the whole thing. Yeah? Or alternatively, you can like you can be aware of which nostril is flowing because after which are you can do any time isn't it yes you can do any time yeah and then you can pose that kind of question that you need uh, you know answers yeah. to yeah i have found it totally unnecessary to keep observing which nostril is open and which is closed all the time the only time i would do that is when i want to do nadi shodhana and i'm beginning to check which is active which is passive and then accordingly doing the nadi shodhanam the you know the which, which we did a couple of sessions ago and of course then when you practice sushumna application itself because in sushumna application you need to open that nostril that is blocked so for everybody who said right side would need to now open also the left nostril and those who said left would also need to open the right so that both start flowing right so that's the only time i would observe my breath because the rest of the time you should be observing life if you are listening to the online meeting then listen to me don't don't keep looking at your breath we did that as an experiment <laughs> if you're driving a car now you don't say okay should i look at what my breath i have can i drive the car you know just pay attention to life to whatever it is you're doing whatever is at hand all right okay so there are two different kinds of methods basically that you can use to apply sushumna 
There's the external methods and the method without external aids. So the method applying uh, using external aids, the first one is applying pressure on the arms. Now, um, some of you may be familiar, you may have seen pictures, uh, you may have seen some sadhus walking around in India or you may have definitely seen pictures because these days you don't see so many sadhus walking around in India where they have, I did some research just before the meeting and I found this for you because um, I didn't know how to describe it otherwise is um, they have something like this. This is a little stick. This is what the sannyasis used to carry around. They had a kamandalu. It was a bowl. It was doubled up as a water bowl as well as a begging bowl. And, and they had their wooden slippers. And they had this kind of a stick with them. It's a short stick, not a long stick. It's not a staff. It's not a walking stick. It's a short stick. What do you think it's used for? Does anybody know? Yeah, I think they this covered part they put it in the armpit, one of the armpits, and they rest it. Exactly, exactly. And so yeah. now you know why they put it under the armpit. They, so they were activating that part. Exactly. When you put it under the right arm, the left breath gets activated. If you put it under the left arm, create a pressure, the right breath gets activated. So it's the pressure which is created. And the, the stick was always made to the, in a way that when they sat down in meditation, it was not too short and it was not too long. It was just high enough so that it created a pressure in the armpit under your, you know, arm. And with that pressure, activated the opposite nostril. Yes, Matthias, I'm sure there are lots of things you've not heard before. <laughs> so, and this is a very ancient um, um, practice which carries on to the state and of course you have not heard of it before because the Swamis and Sadhus uh, did not tell anybody about this. And nobody, most people did not ask. They didn't want to show their ignorance. So. so that is one method. It's not recommended. It is an external method. It's a it's a, I'll also explain to you why it's not recommended. The other way you can do it is by lying on the opposite side. So if you are not sitting now in meditation but lying down, if you lie on your left side, then the right nostril will be activated. If you lie on the right side, the left, uh, yeah, the left nostril will be activated. Always the opposite nostril gets activated. Okay. This is common knowledge. If it is news for you, then, well, something new. But it's uh, in the yogic circles, very common knowledge. Which is why after meals, for example, it is recommended to lie on the left side. That activates the right nostril, which activates the digestive system. You know, the, the, act the, the more dynamic systems in the body. The third way is Vishnu Mudra, using the fingers. So all these are external. I would actually put lying on the opposite side as number one, because in that you can't even sit in meditation position. You have to lie down for that. That disturbs your practice. If you have done this wonderful practice, you know, uh, of all the breaths and and from asanas to breath, etc. And you're sitting and you're doing Nadi Shodhanam, etc. And now suddenly you have to lie down. That, that makes no sense because you want to sit in meditation and not lie down. So this would actually be number one. I should change that. Number two is applying pressure 
underarms. You still need uh, a stick. You're dependent on something. Number three is using fingers. So you're not dependent on any external things in the sense of, yes, your hands are external, but they are still a part of you. And finally, when you don't use hands, a fourth method using willpower, the power of attention. So far, good. Anybody needs to ask something? Any questions? Yes. So the first two methods are definitely not suitable in our tradition. The Samaya tradition, you want to go inwards. And as I said, lying down would disturb the entire practice, which has been nicely developed, you know from movement to stillness and that would disturb the pressure on the arms using the stick would also disturb because um, you would need to then put uh, an external aid then you would need you know again there would be more movement using the fingers would be minimum movement required and as i said that's okay but only for a short duration of time as a transition, you can use that until you just have mastered the technique in, for example, Nadi Shodnam. But once you have mastered the technique of Nadi Shodnam and you're confident of being able to shift the nostrils, flow of, nos flow of breath in the nostrils, then you do not need to use the fingers anymore because then you use purely attention. Focus your attention at that nostril and it will come free, it will open. So now another uh, disadvantage of using the Vishnu Mudra is that as long as one breath is flowing freely, then you're using your fingers to close that and to open the other. So again you are disturbing the flow of that particular active nostril as well. And so it could happen that this technique would cause the freely flowing nostril, the active nostril to be blocked again. And so again that would leave us with only one nostril flowing freely. So it's not a very efficient method can be only used by beginners who have not mastered the fourth method as yet. And so the method we are taught is practicing pranayam for practicing pranayam in the Samaya tradition is you do it without fingers and you just pay attention to the nostril and that's right here you know you just open the flow of that which is blocked if you feel this is blocked pay attention over there and let it flow and if you feel this one is blocked then pay attention to that and let it flow okay so Yeah, um, Matthias asks, can we develop the ability to work with pranic energies and other nadis? Why do you want to waste your time, Matthias? There are only three nadis that you need to know anything about. You just need to know about Sushumna, basically. And if you want better health, you need to have free-flowing Sushumna. Just other nadis all emerge out of this one. You know, when you have a problem, you have to go to the root. 
you can keep uh, dealing with the superficial aspects but these superficial aspects will not cure you they will keep coming back and back again if the root is rotten you now if you think of it as a plant if the roots are rotten how can you help the plant by doing something else on the surface so by treating the plant on the surface is in health you have to go to the root of the problem okay so all you have to do is pay attention to the blocked nostril that's it pretty simple So it may sound amazing or impossible to use the power of attention to get the nostril to flow freely. If you have prepared yourself before, that should not be difficult, which means if you have prepared yourself especially with Nadi Shodhanam. All the other practices as well, but Nadi Shodhanam, also known as Anurom Vilom, very important practice to do. The experience has shown that if the preparation is correct with daily practice you can master the fourth method without fingers using only will power in 10 days i only know one person who did it in 10 days so that should not be the benchmark even if you need 3 to 4 months that's totally a respectable amount of time so the threshold to an unknown world only when both nostrils are freely flowing then sushumna the central channel is open then you start meditation everything as before that was preparation for meditation a lot of people come to me and then they say i've been meditating for 5 years i had somebody who told me he was meditating for 13 years so i asked him what he was doing and he explained to me his practice and it comprised of doing series of asanas you know just like surya namaskar is a series of asanas there were many different series that he was doing it was part of this vinyasa flow and so that was his practice and he was doing some 8 to 9 series and it took him about an hour and that he was calling meditation some people sit for a while for 5 minutes with their eyes closed and then they say oh i i was meditating so there are many different ideas of what meditation is the word meditation now is just used very freely in the colloquial language and it means many different things from a technical point of view meditation begins when the sushumna is open when the central canalis is open anything you do before that is strictly speaking not meditation the sanskrit word is dhyana it is the seventh step in the eighth limbs of yoga in ashtanga yoga the word ashtanga yoga itself is being used in many different forms like a brand name that from the yoga sutras ashtanga yoga is eight limbs of yoga and dhyana meditation is the seventh limb so doing a whole bunch of series of asanas is not meditation sitting and worrying is not meditation okay any questions so far
Nimat here says, um, somebody said that meditation comes after perfected concentration. I don't know what that means because the word concentration can mean anything. Yogic terminology is very precise. So you have to understand the technical meaning of it and you can only understand the technical meaning when you attain that. Because everybody can discuss things intellectually, which is what generally happens. But if you don't have the experience of that state, how shall you know what is dhyana, what is samadhi, right? What is dharna, which is the sixth limb? So people give some definitions out of books. And those who meditate and experience, they do not define those things like books are defining them. You know, there are books on Yoga Sutras, commentaries, which are very technical, written by scholars. A lot of uh, uh, commentaries uh, are made on the commentaries, which are made on commentaries. It's very complicated. And in reality, the Yoga Sutras are quite simple. They're simple, not easy. There's a difference between the two. The process of driving a cycle, a bicycle, is very simple. You get on a cycle, you need to balance, and then you move around the, the, the wheel. You have to and, and, and pedal the wheels, you know. You, that's very simple. The basic concept is simple. But you need practice. So driving it is not easy, but the concept is simple. Yoga sutras are similar. Conceptually, it is, it's quite simple. But understanding it can become difficult because people don't have experience of these things. Meditation is not a thoughtless mind, Manoj. No, it is not. Nor is it positive thoughts and remembering happy moments. If you have a object of concentration, for example a mantra, and only when this mantra is vibrating in your sound, in your mind, in your entire body, it seems the whole world has become the mantra. The mantra is in you, around you, and the mantra is you. There is nothing else that is dhyana. Hey, Mashri, I'm sorry, but I cannot answer that question here. We are doing a session on mastering pranayam. Okay? So... Um, and that's a question that we can only discuss and I only discuss with those who are uh, with me in the sense who I'm guiding. I uh, give guidance to individuals and real people. I cannot guide somebody I do not know. Right? So if you are interested, you can write to me, tell me about yourself, what you have done, what you're doing what you want, why you want to do this, and then we will see how that goes forward. Okay. So one thing to take care of here in Sandhya, or breath awareness, is a, a mistake that's made by a lot of people, is they think that they have to uh, concentrate or, or pay attention at the point here, on this point here, you know, at the uh, tip of the nose. It's not the tip of the nose that you have to pay attention at. Your attention should be focused between the two nostrils, right here at this um, point just below both the nostrils and between the nostrils. Why is that mistake made? You know, there is in Sanskrit they say nasigagra, nasigagra, and they think that that is supposed to be somehow here, the tip of the nose. So not the tip of the nose. 
the deepest state of now we are coming to the very deep states of sandhya what it means is we are inviting the hidden to come forward that was that threshold between the conscious and the unconscious mind and when the sandhya is open you are at that threshold a well prepared student who is fearless will invite that hidden to come forward only a well prepared student most students are not prepared and they are not fearless but they get very ambitious and then they sometimes start uh, doing such things <laughs> and they end up in trouble because then just the ego gets activated or they come into touch with the fears or desires which are in the mind and then they get miserable they come in touch with the first layer what we call unacceptable qualities and what is unacceptable qualities they are the things that the conscious mind does not want to know about and so the deep memories that we don't want to remember unpleasant memories painful memories very powerful emotions like anger jealousy desires that are unacknowledged or will remain unfulfilled desire for fame desire for success desire for offspring if you don't have a uh, sexual desires deep rooted fears fears very common fears no most of us are not fearful i would not describe certain people here whom i know personally in this meeting as fearful they are not nervous scared people but we all have common fears such as fear of poverty fear of losing your beloved one fear of loneliness fear of disease fear of old age fear of death or certain individual fears depending on each person some are afraid of spiders some of snakes some are of heights some are afraid of drowning some are afraid of closed spaces and some are afraid of all of these <laughs> so these are the things that a person then who is really meditating as i said coming into touch with those deep aspects of the unconscious mind they get access to immense and limitless possibilities and these few rare ones know their way in the dark forest of the unconscious mind and these rare ones can recognize each other It is said in the Tripura Rahasya. One thief recognizes the other, so also a jani recognizes another. And when they can do this, and they have know the secret of the three worlds, the three worlds or the three three states of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, these yogis, seers, sages, saints. they speak a mystical language known as sandhya bhasha a twilight -like language matias what do you mean by what comes in dreams yeah the unconscious mind when you're dreaming the unconscious mind is is active yes but um, but at that point of time you are you are you're unconscious strictly speaking you're not aware of your dreams but when that unconscious mind comes forward then and make you be, it becomes conscious to you then you are talking about sandhya so sandhya the mystic sandhya bhasha the mystical language of the yogis the twilight language is basically for the is those who know the secret of the three worlds the three worlds are waking dreaming and sleep and such a person understands symbolic language that is sandhya bhasha and when you have already advanced you are very advanced practitioner an adept such a one
understands or the mystery of life and death is unveiled before him. The most ancient of all mysteries. And Sandhya is also that transition between death, life and death again. Matthias, what to do with tendencies, desires, fears, meditate. Learn meditation, master the system, the systematic practice. Begin with your food habits, begin with simple things like training your body for asanas. Do simple breathing practices that we have already discussed in the, right in the earlier sessions like diaphragmatic breathing, equal breathing. And these will go a much longer way than doing complicated practices. Keep it simple. Any questions so far? Good. Then uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. We will meet up for our next meetings on Friday and Sunday, uh, which will be the last meetings before our break. We take our break after the meeting on Sunday next week, and we will meet again then in August. So last two sessions are on Friday, next Friday and Sunday. It's nice having you all. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you, Radhika. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, Mikhailis. Sneaked in at some point of time. Hi, <laughs> Yeah. Are you? I'm back now. Oh, you're back home. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, next week I'll be normal. Okay. That's going to be our last uh, 